And we are live with episode 159 of the Start, Build, Grow Show. What is up, everybody? We finally got the man, the legend himself, Randy Brothers, back in business for Showtime, for the podcast. We had to file a, a missing person report, but we, we were finally fi- able to get him. He was walking on the street with some spare tires. Uh, I think he had a, a tire blow or something like that on, on his way back from a camping trip from Moab or something. He'll have to fill us in, but we finally got him back. Randy Brothers, welcome back. How are we doing, my friend? Man, thank you, sir, for holding it down. As always, the ratings go up when I'm gone. Way up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was awesome, man. Family trip. We did a road trip. Um, great experiences. Factory tires on fifth wheels are not good. That's the lesson. Uh, they do not <laughs> withstand a full 1, 1,200 mile road trip. And I had lots of tire issues on the way back. Got stopped three different times. Three different tires went out. So it was a fun adventure on the way back. But um Ultimately, it was an cre- incredible experience for myself, for the family. So very much appreciate you guys for watching. Stay in tune for Nick for holding it down. And we're back, man. I'm back. I'm ready to rock and roll. Business is, you know, back on track. Life is good. And uh, we have another awesome guest with us. We've got Adam Benzeman, mm-hmm. as you may, as you know him as the Roof Strategist. You've probably seen him on pretty much every social media outlet. And uh, spitting knowledge and uh, and helping serve in the industry, <clears throat> kindred spirit of mine. I'm looking forward to connecting with you more, my friend, and hearing about your story. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Hey, thank you both for for having me. It's an honor to be here, and glad I got to be blessed with Randy's presence. Uh, yeah. After, after his absence, so thank you again, yeah. and I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, everything we have in store today. You know, Adam, the, the roofing space loves you, man. You know, we, we put out a post on the, the, the roofing entrepreneurs group. So if you guys aren't in our group, make sure you guys check that out. And, and Jose uh, from New Era, he said, hey, you got to have Adam on, but I'm not going to lie. I've heard nothing but great things. Why, why does everybody in the roofing space love you so much, man? What's going on? This is, a, I, I don't know. I don't, you're going to make me blush. I don't know, man. I just really like helping people succeed. And, yeah. and I, I know what it's like to be in the trenches and I know how I remember like it was yesterday, what it was like to get started. And mm-hmm. I believe the growth for all businesses, um, start what I say is the, the, the bottom up from the individual rep in the field. So to me, everything I do, whether I'm serving an individual rep or if I'm serving a team, it's the same focus, help rep succeed. And if we can do mm-hmm. that, the rest falls into place. We don't have production problems without sales. We don't have cash flow problems. <laughs> Actually, you can have cash flow problems without sales. Sales <laughs> fixes cash flow problems many times. <laughs> yeah. But uh, my point is, when the, when these folks succeed, it, it it it's kind of that simple, I guess. And I don't know. I just do what I love. I love Absolutely. doing this stuff, and maybe that comes across. <laughs> Very cool, well, man. Well, for hey, for for the few who might not know who you are, what what's your background story? How did you get into the roofing industry? Yeah, good question. I'll give you the lightning fast version so we can jump to the good stuff today. Um, I fell into the business mm-hmm. on accident, as did most. I was a massage therapist. I did the whole thing where you get a, a degree. So I got a degree in psychology, led me nowhere. I ended up following my passion in natural medicine, got licensed in massage therapy, and uh, ended up working as a massage therapist and earning poverty level wages. I was earning about $1,600 a month. And um, I couldn't afford gas to go visit my family on Easter. It was a two hour drive and I was in my twenties and I had to um, call my mom and ask her to send me money over our banking app, which this doesn't exist anymore uh, for 20 bucks. So I could fill up my truck to drive to see family. It was the most demoralizing and demasculating moment in my life. And on the drive in, I called her to thank her. And I said, I got to make a change. This whole passion thing is, is not working out. And my stepdad had been in the roofing industry in Denver um, years ago, largely retail driven company. And he says, Hey, you can make six figures knocking doors, selling roofs. And I I was like, no, you can't. That's people don't earn six figures. Yeah. Unless you have like a degree and you work your way up the ladder and all this. So I fell in and the rest is history quickly. I earned my first six figures in about eight months. Um, 
pretty much fully self-taught and worked my way up to COO or chief operating officer of a company. And we operated in five states and six cities. Uh, grew a pretty sizable sales team and then jumped on to this side, as people refer it to, and have had the privilege and opportunity to work with um, companies all over the U.S., Canada, and Australia now. And nice. I'm serving folks from the individual rep trying to earn his or her first six figures or multi six figures in their first year to companies doing 70 plus million a year in, in revenue. So you name it. And it, it, that's my that's my uh, my my quick and dirty snapshot of, of the story of how this whole thing came to be. I love it, man. Very cool. So were you able to pick it up pretty quickly when you when you first got into roofing sales or was there a little bit of a learning curve or how was that process for you? It's a demoralizing learning curve. Um, I was eight weeks late on a pretty big storm in Madison, Wisconsin. <clears throat> I didn't, when I got hired, and by the way, the gentleman I worked with is an absolutely amazing human being. I never left the company. This is no fault to anyone. It's just how this business goes. As many owners who are listening can attest to, we, we, we want to invest in our team, but time resources ability are limited. And I was one of those people in a new office location. And my training was, here's a shirt, here's a sample board, and generally, here's a contingency, now go do it. And I was like, do I need a ladder? How do I set a ladder up? What do I look for on a roof? Like, I, I'm talking like nothing, nothing. So I didn't even have a hail swath. And then when I finally got one, I went to ground zero, about nine weeks late and knocking doors on ground zero, you know, after it's been pounded to death, I just got slaughtered. Um, and that's when I developed the first piece of the, of my marketing material you know, that's in my battle pack was I was started to leave letters at the door when no one was home, try to maximize my efforts and stand, stand apart. So learning curve was steep. Um, and I ended up on a lucky break, making my first sale on a commercial property, leaving the gym, burning steam, just questioning whether or not this whole thing was going to work. And I saw a for rent sign and I called up with a pitch I'd never done before and landed my first deal. And this week, someone had heard that story. Cause I was leaving Ford's gym in Madison, Wisconsin. And it was the strip, the strip center that it's in that I sold that roof. And this guy reaches out to me over email. I think it was two days ago. And he says, dude, I'm from Madison and I work out at Ford's. What a small world. And I was like, yeah, next time you leave Ford's turn, right? That's the, my first roof that I sold 90 square commercial roof. Um, and then, uh, and then, but yeah, it was, it was slow going. A lot of painful mistakes that I could probably chat your ear off about, but dude, that everybody so knows cool. what that's like. The, the self doubt, questioning the industry, questioning whether or not it's legit and, and needing to dig deep into ourselves and find, um, discover a new version of ourselves that we didn't know existed to make things happen. What's crazy is I've actually been to that gym too. I'm from Milwaukee area. And I think I took some boxing lessons at that, yeah. at that gym for a gym. It's a very popular boxing and powerlifting gym. And I boxed there and I powerlifted there. Uh, so yeah, small world. They have the boxing ring right in that front window. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome, man. So, so did that boost your confidence then? You're like, I got a little swagger. I got a little confidence. Now I feel like I got something going. You know, yes and no. Um, yes, because I had defied all the advice. Even, you know, family was, with rare exception, was kind of doubting whether or not I should take this leap. They're like, you know, stick with this secure job. I was like, secure is, I mean, I was living on $4 a day of groceries calculated. I didn't even go out for a subway foot long. I was so broke. And people, you know, don't, don't go commission only, stick with stable. I'm like, what's stable about being broke? That's not stable. And I had to kind of reach this point, which I know many new people do of whether or not you go all in, you know, all in on roofing sales versus like juggling the bartending job, juggling the side gig for cash flow. And I went all in um, because I knew when I was doing this massage gig, it was Saturdays, Sundays and weekends, excuse me, uh, evenings. Well, that's prime selling time. And I was required to be within 10 minutes of this massage therapy location, but I was only paid if I was booked. So if I had a cancellation or if I wasn't booked, I was sitting there not getting paid. And I said, you know what? I knew my average commission could be about two grand. So if I could make a sale, one sale, I would earn pretty much more than an entire month's worth of work. So I was like, I'm taking the leap, not married, no kids. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm betting on myself and I'm going to make it happen. And I had uh, luckily about six weeks of income saved up. So I had about two grand in savings roughly. And obviously I had the added expense of buying stuff. And 
when I had that first commission check come in, it's like I say, roofing sales is a drug. Your first hit is free and then you're hooked. And the first hit is that commission check. You're like, what? That that happened just from like talking to people and having fun and being out in the, in, in the world. And I was really excited. Uh, but I knew that I had just, I had so much to learn and it was just the beginning and, and just that constant you know, pressure. Where's my next meal coming from? And I wasn't used to that hunter mindset of eat what you kill. That's the name of the game, you know, and, and I had never hunted before. I had zero sales experience. So it was, it was a, a fun journey and uh, I learned a lot along the way and, and kind of led me to where I am now. And it's wild to think where I'd be if it weren't for this industry. <laughs> yeah, I can attest to that, man. I was living on couches, yeah, I, you know, mm -hmm. living on couches, borrowing money, like trying to do whatever I can to survive, knocking doors, trying to make sales and, uh, yeah. and that, you know, going through that, I feel like the, the lesson that we, I, I learned, it's like, it's carried, carried with me through all my career at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you know, I share that and now it's led me to where we are now. And, and, I, and some people just, they want the easy route, but like the hard road sometimes is the better road because the things you learn, it's just can't be taught in a course and can't be taught through, through a mentor. Like you just got to, be in that situation and and mm -hmm. experience it. it's like a rite of passage right for yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs to just go through some of these things because the things you learn are are, are pretty incredible but yeah, yeah i get mm -hmm. it and knock doors and and trying to find borrow money to put in my gas tank and i luckily my i i, I the owner i started working with he he gave me my first ladder. So he had an extra ladder <laughs> in, in his truck and he gave me a ladder i was like oh, thanks <laughs> along with uh you know contracts and some some trifolds and uh and a 30 second pitch on hey here say this and say this and here's the contracts go sell roofs yeah all right let's figure it out you know <laughs> bring in a deal you'll get paid cool how do i do it That's a, that, was, that was the big question to me which i'm sure we'll get to but everyone's like oh you can make six figures and and then everyone says well how you know it's the obvious question and and, and then it kind of stops with the obvious answer of well if your average commission is a thousand or two thousand bucks sell 50 or 100 jobs whatever the number is and I knew um, I was doing calculations off a hundred, excuse me, a thousand average, thousand dollar average commission. So it was a hundred jobs and that's it. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, well, how do I sell our jobs? And it's like eating an elephant, you know, it's such a daunting task. We have to remember it's a process. And Randy, I agree with you, what you said, you know, no, no, you, you can learn things in a classroom. You can get the roadmap, but the roadmap doesn't mean anything if you don't get behind the wheel and take control. Because if you mm -hmm. sit in the passenger seat and you're just waiting for someone to jump in and drive you there, it ain't happening. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where was your mindset then where you're like, all right, well, I, to hit my goal, I have to sell 100 jobs. You know, how did you start to break that down a little bit easier so you can really understand what you have to do in terms of action items to complete that? It's a really good question. Um, I knew I had to become someone I'd never been before. And to me, the journey was embracing personal development. And I knew that the reward was earning a healthier income. And I, my first mission was to turn to the personal development world. I said, hey, I, I'm going from poverty level wages to wanting to be a six-figure earner, which at that point, I thought like if you earned $100,000, you were like top 1% Lamborghini driving. Like I just had never seen this kind of money. Now I realize you need a little bit more than $100,000 to drive a Lamborghini. But, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'm sure there's creative people that may do it. But and, and you, yeah. well, you just don't, you just don't, don't have, to have, have a house, you know. Exactly. You don't have to have a house. Yeah, no you house. Need, He's you buying know. a Lambo. Yeah, yeah there's creative ramen in your Lambo, and that's it. So, so I, I'm sitting here, and I'm like, so how? You know, I knew that to earn this kind of money, I had to become a different person, and I was someone who is incredibly sensitive. I did not have thick skin. I was a peacekeeper. You know, don't don't upset anybody. So knocking doors was obviously um, not an easy thing to, to wrap my mind around. I didn't deal with rejection well, and I knew that I needed to get through that. So the first thing I did was turn to this personal development space and say, who, who's done this before and what can I learn from these people? And of course, I started doing through books, the, the, the classics. But I grabbed this one book by Brian Tracy called Goals, How to Achieve Everything in Life or How to Achieve Everything in Life Faster Than You Ever Dreamed Possible or something to that effect. Just great search book. Goal. It's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. It was the first mm -hmm. time I flagged every single exercise in that book. It's sitting on my bookshelf over there. And I did every single exercise. 
I wrote my goals down. I wrote down my bottleneck as Brian Tracy called it. I wrote down all the things that I needed and I learned where my weakness was. And I put together that daily plan and I printed out on a blank piece of paper, wrote the word how on the back and I taped it. I didn't have, I had very little furniture in my apartment. So my bed was on the ground. Um, I didn't have a door. I was in some tiny studio <laughs> and I taped it up. So I'd see it every morning, the word how, and I had one through 100 printed out next to it. So I could check them off. And every day I took all Brian's Tracy's advice on time management, goal setting, planning my day the night before. So each day I just went out there and I would not quit until I hit my goal for the day. And that goal evolved, you know, first it was just go, go knock this many doors. All right. My first goal, start a conversation because I'm sick of people kicking me off their porch, you know? <laughs> and then yeah, I, I got pretty good at that, but then I couldn't close the deal. So that led me to the next evolution of, of learning, which I'm sure we'll get to. But the biggest thing to me was embracing the challenge and realizing that this isn't turnkey success. It's not, hey, here's this new opportunity. Jump in. You know what you do. It's learning any new skill takes time. If you want to get into any new hobby, you're not like going to become a pro golfer, a pro mountain biker, a pro weightlifter, you know, or bodybuilder because you went to the gym once. It's, it's a process and it's so daunting to go through that when it's your neck on the line, literally at people's doorsteps. So to me, the journey was a personal development journey. And I realized that that was the most important journey because looking back, I am nowhere even close to that same person. I mean, in my heart, I'm sure, but in terms of who I, who I am and how I bring myself to the world, nothing, nothing similar at all. I wanted to pull this up too, Adam. I thought yeah. this was really cool. So maybe if you don't mind running through this as the daily yeah. scorecard, I was watching some of the videos that you had yesterday. And a big thing is, is like optimizing your life mm -hmm. and self-development and stuff like that. But it is nice to be able to keep score some way yeah. when you're working at self-development because it's really hard to, to understand where you're at. So maybe go through this yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I have to give full credit to um, Rob Deerdeck for this idea. I don't know if he does this exact program, but I, I listened to a podcast on the uh, Jordan Harbinger show with Rob Deerdeck, and he talked about qualitatively scoring different aspects of his life. And no joke, I've listened to this podcast three to four times, three full through, and then going back and listening to it. I listened to it with my wife again, and... Um, what he talks about is optimizing life. He sat down in 2014 and designed what he wanted his life to look like. And Rob Deerdeck, if you don't know, performs at a very high level. He's an incredibly accomplished entrepreneur. And he talks about basically this, this main compass that if something doesn't provide energy to you, you need to get rid of it or find a way for it to fuel your energy. And I have always been a geek on kind of optimizing performance. So I listened to that podcast and I started this and this is still part of my daily routine. I've since added two categories, so I'll update this. But I started to score myself one through 10 each day. And what's wild and the reason behind it is that in roofing sales, we bring ourselves to work in a way that we wouldn't, if I worked, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, if I worked at the DMV, it doesn't really matter what's going on. I'm taking orders, I push buttons, I follow a thing. Like it really, it, it doesn't, who you are outside of work doesn't really impact your work all that much, right? You're gonna get your tasks done. But in roofing sales, you have a fight with your girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband, that carries on. You got health stuff in the background, you're freaking out. I know so many people like this team I just trained in Houston have, have children with some, some special needs. You know, they're, that's their why to, to fuel it. And if you have a family issue and then you turn, you're like, hey, I'm here at your doorstep. It's like, you gotta flip the switch and it's so hard. So there's really no separation from who we are outside of work versus inside of work. So I began scoring one through 10 in these, each, each of these key areas, uh, sleep, the morning routine, which everyone's got their own. Mine is uh, meditation, stretching, journaling, and then exercise um, of some of some sort. And then I listen to audiobooks while I have my coffee and all that. Uh, fitness and food, goal progress, meaning each day I have a mini goal, and it's all about getting that bigger goal. Another great book, The One Thing, uh, by Gary yep. Keller. And my energy level, and then my relationships. And I know that I get it, have a tendency to get wrapped up in things. And my wife is the first one to remind me like, Hey, remember me? I'm like, Oh yeah. My biggest cheerleader, my biggest fan, the love of my life. And the person I never want to, to hurt, uh, you know? So this was a, a reminder to be present in relationship. So I started scoring these things and I started to, to realize that my energy was directly impacted by my sleep. 
My energy was directly impacted by my morning routine. My goal progress had a direct relationship to fitness because I find if I don't burn energy, I'm just like, I get antsy and squirrely and don't focus. So there's all these weird relationships between these areas. So I would sit down and tally them up and then reflect at the end of each day. Why did I have a poor score in this department? Oh yeah, I went to bed too late. I don't drink alcohol any longer and I get in bed at like nine o'clock. And that's a routine that just works for me. And even on the weekends, I don't like breaking it. I do every now and again, but it's not ideal. And I found that by, by having this regimen, I began to optimize how I live my daily life. And it allowed me to have this, this energy and output in my work that I was like, oh my gosh, all from just scoring myself one through 10 on how I felt about something. So I made an Instagram post one day sharing this and said, does anyone want this thing? And people said, yeah, let's do it. So that's kind of what started the video and then putting this up for, for free. And I have some follow-ups. I pop over to folks and uh, some information to help them use it in, in their real world. So anyway, does that answer I your love question? It. Yeah, I love it, man. I'm all about that. That's really cool. I mean, so, Randy, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you're like, um, it's, I love no, it. You're it's like, I'm, I'm kind of like rehashing every so often, right? You go through cycles in life and mm -hmm. I'm like, there was a time in life where, you know, it was, I was working out two hours a day, six days a week and getting mm -hmm. businesses started. I mean, at this point I run like four or five different businesses. I'm very involved coaching and doing all these things as well. And, and there's so many certain areas of life that can easily fall out of whack or fall out of balance. Right. I don't, I like that. I'm going to kind of probably merge this. So I'm going to merge the two because the way I look at that same kind of concept is there's five, I look at it as like a sliding scale. <clears throat> there's five key elements. You got your mind, body, spirit, family, and business. Mm -hmm. So I like you that. grade yourself on each one of those. And you can actually probably create a couple different categories for each one of those, right? Yeah. And and it, imagine it's like a sliding scale mm -hmm. and you have plus five, negative five. And at any time, because the reality of it is we all, we all, the, we're going to, I'm going to live a balanced life. I'm, it doesn't exist. Okay. It's, it's about up and down. It's about yeah. knowing when one of those areas in life are below grade or below mm -hmm. that zero mark and shift your energy towards that to get it back. Mm -hmm. Analyze it, find the one that's low, shift your energy towards getting it back. And then that's what the, really the balance is, is, is being aware of where to put your energy and, and to try to maintain that balance or try to, you know, stay on above ground with mm -hmm. all those areas of business. So that's kind of how I look at that same type of thing. And mm -hmm. as I, I kind of go through and, you know, we're similar, right? We both coaches and, you know, influencers have uh, followings and all this stuff and people watching the podcast and all this, I honestly, to, to be a little bit vulnerable here, I kind of got to a point where, you know, I really looked at myself and I'm like, what areas am I just crushing, right? I'm all in all the time on business, right? I can talk business, do business, work on business, entrepreneurs all the time, okay? Decent with family, decent, you know, with, with spirit. You know, for me, it's like, you know, it's important that that, that, I, that I go to church and read the Bible and do things like that. It's important to me. And body was like last. It was like working out once every couple of weeks or whatever. And I'm just like felt lethargic. I wasn't sleeping well. I was sleeping, not getting up early. And, and it's like, wait a minute, something's going on. I need something to just shock the system. And, uh, and that's what ultimately kind of circled me back. I'm like, one day I just literally woke up. I'm like, no more excuses, no more bull crap. And I dove in and I started the 70, 75 day hard. Right. So I'm, I'm 30 day 30, I think today. And, right. and it's Congrats. been, it's been a revelation of, you know, that morning routine. Like I forced myself to focus on all those five elements, get in that morning routine in place. And what the unbeknownst to me, how many people are watching and messaging me and starting. And I mean, I think at least, at least eight to 10 people have started doing it. I didn't think about, it. I was like, I'm just going to put this out there. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be that guy. Right. Yeah. And little, little did I know the other people are like, you know what? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and that's, that's mm -hmm. awesome, right? That's just that, that intrinsic benefit you don't really realize. But for those of you who are out there resonating with this, I mean, high achievement comes in the, in the, the, the presence of high expectations and, and, okay. and high work ethic. And, and to get to there, you, the small things you got to do continually, continuously over time and, and you'll see large results. So start with that routine, start with an analysis of your day-to-day -day operations personally and and a lot of us too we run these businesses we're working burning both ends of the candle 
And we're like, I have no time for family. I have no time to work out. I have no time for these things. But here's the thing. If you take that time to read, to work out, to spend time with your family, it gives you more intense clarity when you are working. You yeah. tend to just naturally make that shift mm -hmm. work way more efficient. People don't really like with all the things I do, I don't, I don't even want to tell you what the actual hours I'm putting in working. People will be pissed off at me. <laughs> but the reality of it is I've gotten to a place, surrounded myself with people, and I'm hyper, hyper obsessive about my time. And every hour, every minute of every day has a purpose. And when you can get there, it's amazing the things you can accomplish. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Completely well, agree. Well, I agree. Mm -hmm. And so since you started the 75 hard, would you say that your, 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 like your sleep has been better, your relationships, energy, all that stuff, would you say that's all been better too? Everything. It's all on board, man. Everything. Mm -hmm. It's like, and, and it, the crazy thing is this crap, one of the biggest excuses <laughs> I had, right? I was telling myself, I knew I kind of wanted to do it. My wife did it at the beginning of the year and I'm like, okay, it's probably something I should do, right? It's a good idea. I should <laughs> challenge myself excuse after excuse after excuse well the right the wrong timing i got vacation coming up and i'm gonna want to drink beer on vacation you know oh how do i work out twice i'm doing a freaking seven day road trip <laughs> stop right get rid of all that crap there's not gonna be a right time mm -hmm. okay it, it, oh well it's okay mm -hmm. it's sacrifice is only gonna help you be stronger mm -hmm. you know funny even they mentioned the alcohol thing right I can look back at my whole life, you know, I'm not saying I've never been a, a, outside of college, right? I've never been like a big drinker, right? Mm -hmm. But since freaking high school, I don't remember a time I went 30 days without having a beer. Yeah. That's, that's Honestly, the conversation. You, you think about yeah. that. For most adults, think about that. I, that's the, the conversation like, that led my wife and I to both stop. It was about three years ago. You know, just becomes a daily routine. And then she's like, when was the last time you didn't drink for even a week? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> let's not go there. I don't know. She's like, well, let's just go 30 days. And that was three years ago. There's wow. always a beer in the fridge, right? There's nice always, a, you know, I like the yeah. fancy scotch or whatever. You know, there's always a little scotch. Was mine and, too. I, and I, I feel great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm up early. My, my alarm doesn't even, I'm up before my alarm even goes off yeah. and ready to go. Getting that morning workout in listening to books, reading two books at a time. Like mm -hmm. for any of you who's on the fence and you really just need a shock to your system, do, I mean, whether it's 75 hard, hard or not, take, take Adam's list and implement it. Take something to give yourself a daily routine, mm -hmm. you know, to, to unlock more potential for yourself. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I, I want to give a quick shout out to some of the people that are watching, commenting. Chuck Allen, he's been he's been on the show with Rio Blanco. Uh, he says, awesome. Looking forward to this great episode. I know he had some issues with his mom in the hospital. Sounds like she's doing good. So glad to hear that. Rachel Irish with SFY is on here. What up, guys? Ty Cobb. Uh, what's up, fellas? We got Latif in the house. What up, fellas? We got Ben. Ben's out in Iowa knocking. I think he closed a couple of deals today. I saw that going down. We got Jose, who's actually the guy with New Era. He connected us actually in that group, and he was, yeah. he was one of the reasons me and you got connected. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, we got Ray with Integrity. She's on here. She says, big fan, Adam. Very cool. Uh, David Taggart, Adam wouldn't be here today without your knowledge, bro. Very cool. Uh, we got Jose. The slap has evolved it's into killers and on the field. What, what what's the slap? What's the slap Jose, here? Thanks for making this happen. Um, the, the slap <laughs> hold that hold that thought. The slap. Yeah. I want to hear about this. But we yeah. gotta give my man John Dye a shout out, right? Yeah. He's on here as well. Another, you know, pioneer in the roofing space. And he just sent me a little message about they're doing a, he's doing a supplementing class. So mm -hmm. anybody's watching this live or watching this later on john if you're still watching man post the link on there uh or, or we'll get nick to do that but he's doing a thousand dollar discount for supplementing uh he's doing a course the guy is like a beast when it comes to teaching supplementing and getting something executed so i figured i'd show that out there and throw that out there for you my man john hopefully you're still watching. absolutely all yeah. right and then we also we got hope we had armando he was he's also doing this 75 hard he said truth so he was vibing the 75 hard action too but all right what's the slap i'm dying to know Gotcha. So the slap formula is the formula that I teach for scripts at the door and context first, and then I'll share what, the, what it is and kind of how it came to be. The biggest problem I see with this industry is word for word scripts. They're robotic. They don't work. 
I'm in a unique position in my role because I serve individual sales reps as well as companies. So I have individual reps reach out a lot and I kind of get the, the chatter of what's not really working so well from, from their leadership. And I can't even tell you how often I hear people say my company pitch isn't working or it doesn't feel natural. So everything that I teach is a formula and think of it like if I gave steak, potatoes, salt, pepper, and butter, five ingredients to seven amazing chefs, I'm going to get seven different dishes, a reverse seared steak, a sous vide steak, a grilled steak, all you name it, different types of potatoes, mashed potatoes, twice baked potatoes, um, broasted potatoes. These all can be done with the same simple ingredients, but the end result is deliciousness on a plate that resembles the chef. And that's why I teach these formulas in my sales approach is it empowers because this industry isn't bringing in people who have like climbed the corporate sales ladder and have formal training. This is a, a, a way that we need to bring people into who you are and bring yourself to the door fully, but paired with a, a, an approach that will work. So slap is the formula at the door. ARO is the objection handling formula. Car park is my closing formula. And again, once people learn them, they just become second nature. So the slap formula came to me. I've been really trying to find a way to teach what I was doing. And it was weeks and weeks. I'm going to bed each night and I'm like trying to I prime my mind. I'm writing down what was the common theme among all the easiest sales I ever made. And to me, everyone's different. I love to catch the old guy mowing his lawn. That was my favorite. Some people are like, I've, t- I've trained guys out there like, I will not talk to someone if they're outside. I only want to knock the door. To me, I'm like, heck, the knocking doors. I just put me in front of the guy who's out there. I'll go stand and smile at him like a doofus. Wait for him to turn the mower off, take his earmuffs off. And each one of these was the same. I started a conversation, but I was like, how do you teach someone to start a conversation without just being like conversation skills? So it was four in the morning and, the, and slap popped into my head. I ran into my office. I had my office was in my home at that point. It's no longer. Go on my big whiteboard and I write down slap. Say hi, S. Say hi and break the ice. L. Let them know why you're there and make it incredibly relevant and familiar to them. A. Ask an open ended question. That's the start. Open ended questions require someone to think. Okay. P. Present to their answer. Now, the one thing I am anti lead with a free inspection. I think this is totally a bogus way to present. This is my opinion. Your result again, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's one disclaimer I gotta say. Just because it's my approach doesn't mean it's everybody's and it's gonna work for everybody. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what I do know is that working through storms, if you don't have a problem with your roof and a strange human shows up selling you a roof inspection for free, right? A free inspection, you need it. No, it's like me showing up being like, hey, I do free tire inspections. Can I go into your garage and inspect your tires? It's like, no, this is so intrusive. And if I had a problem, I would know about it, right? I don't have any leaks. Same thing when dealing with with, uh, retail. There's no problem. Why replace it? On storm, if I don't know if there's damage, why do I need inspection? If I don't think there's damage, why do I need inspection? If my roof was denied and I agree with my insurance, I don't want an inspection. And if I had a partial payment and I agree with my insurance why I don't need an inspection. So you ask the open-ended question, which can be, hey, where are you at in the process? Or what did your insurance company say when you came out or when they came out? Or when was the last time you had your roof inspected and routine maintenance conducted? And now what I've done is I've required them to think and engage with me. And that micro commitment of starting the conversation, their answer is either going to be, what are you talking about? It's been a while. My insurance was out and paid it for a little bit or they denied me. And now I know whichever one of these pitches is going to be relevant to them. I can deliver the right presentation and it's going to require a different formulation. If they say, hey, what are you talking about? Be like, I'm really glad I stopped by Peggy down the street. She had no idea her roof was damaged until I showed her photos and videos. Right now I'm building that social proof to lead up to the need. Or if they say, hey, our insurance was out. They're covering a couple small repairs. We're good. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, a second opinion, you know, doesn't hurt. If a doctor told you you need back surgery, are you going to just go under it? No, you're going to go talk to someone else while I'm here. And then you can go into your pitch for the free inspection. So again, say hi, break the ice, let them know why you're there. And A, ask an open-ended question and P, present to their answer. And it becomes a really fast to iterate formula for any scenario, brand new in the neighborhood. Just sign the customer up. All you do is change the L, by the way, let them know why you're there. Reason I'm stopping by, 
we just, uh, Peggy just chose us to do her roof. Hey, reason I'm stopping by, I just met with Peggy's adjuster from her insurance. We just got a roof approved. Hey, the reason I'm stopping by, I just got off of Peggy's roof doing an inspection. So you're always making it familiar. None of this, we're in the neighborhood today. No, name their street. I'm talking to folks on Lexington. I talked to John two doors down. You know, make it seem like you are the neighborhood person, not like where you have to look around like, where am I? What subdivision am I in? So that's the big idea is to create that familiarity. And then what it allows reps to do is to feel empowered each time they approach a door. And most importantly, they know what to say. And they're not, because that's the biggest complaint I hear from sales reps. I don't know what to say at the door and I get in my head. When I just have this easy, literally three things, say hi, let them know why you're there, ask a question, wait till they respond, present. So it's pretty cool um, seeing people reach out it. having these breakthroughs. And I got, I have tons of stories I could share on that, including a company in Dallas, most competitive market. Guy walks, finishes training in the classroom going through this, knocks five doors, two conversations, one inspection. 30 days later, the owner reaches out to me and goes, hey, just so you know, he's got 40K in the pipeline. But what he meant by 40K was commissions, not sales. $40,000 of commissions in his first 30 days after making these tweaks. And I hear stories like this a lot on that slap formula. So shout out to, um, was it who, Jose that, that, yeah, that, that was Jose. That yeah. Thank oh, you. Jose. That, that's nice awesome. Nice setup right there. Yeah, Absolutely. That, that worked out real well. Glad to see you succeeding with it, man. It's really cool. Yeah. They're crushing it, man. They're crushing it for sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, to thank our sponsors. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll go into the roofing success formula cool. and, and give away the goods right there. So um, awesome. as usual, we're going to start with our headline sponsor, Job Nimbus. If I can get it. Job Nimbus is a fully customizable back office solution. Track leads, jobs, tasks from one easy to use software. And with the largest ecosystem of integrated partners, if we don't do it, we have a friend who does. Learn about the number one back office system in roofing. We can help you be efficient, be organized, be professional, and be profitable. So if you guys somehow have not checked out Job Nimbus and are not using a CRM tool for your company, or if you're looking for a different CRM tool, make sure you check them out at info.jobnimbus.com backslash roofing dash academy. And we got some great tools that actually do integrate as well with their sponsorship. So we do have Hail Trace as well. If you're in the hail game, if you're working hail claims and, and selling roofs that, are, that have hail damage, you need to know where the hail is, how big the hail is, and when it hailed. I mean, if you're on the fence, it's a game changer. So check them out at hailtrace.com. And man, Randy, that beard never looked so good, man. That was looking good back then. And last but not least, we got... <laughs> what the hell was I doing with that thing? <laughs> and last but not least, we got Sumo Quote. Are you looking to stand out with your proposal? Sumo Quote is the contractor quote that crushes the competition. It is the fastest way to build custom quotes that impresses clients and wins more work. It's one of those must-have technologies for roofing contractors, allowing them to sell faster, sell more, and sell smarter. Be sure to check them out at try.sumoquote.com backslash start, build, grow. Unbelievable too there with, with Sumo Code as well. All right. Now we're back to the show. Adam, the roofing success formula. Break it down for us. Yeah, for sure. So um, this is my philosophy of scaling sales operations. I know that there's lots of different schools of thought. And I said this before. I'm going to say it again. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic cure or magic pill. That being said, I have yet to see these three elements of the formula not fully present and see companies grow. In other words, if you don't have all this stuff in place, regardless of the system, technology, resources, people, sales process, sales training, growth is either going to stagnate or this is where we see companies declining. And it's three things. And just to, to, to frame it, when you asked Nick about my journey in roofing sales, and I said the first thing I did was I turned to becoming a person who is capable of earning six figures, which meant flexing and growing personally, which led me to the first part of the formula, which is the B, who you, who you are and who you will become. And for owners, this is the people on your team, getting the right people. 
And then out in the field, I told you, I started to kind of crack the code. I developed some letters, you know, that I was leaving at the door for folks. I just happened to have a lot of these samples on here and it, it helped me stand out. So I started to create the right sales activities and I created my system, knock the door, leave this letter, show back up, have this pitch. So I create right sales activities, which led me to the do, doing the right sales activities each and every day. And then my next obstacle was I, I was hungry. I had like the right mindset. I was becoming this new person, growing, evolving, doing the right things, but I could not close a deal to save my life. And at that point, there was no YouTube channels. There was no podcasts on roofing stuff. We, I had to piece together what I could, so I started studying sales, but nothing translated directly over to roofing. The specific objections, my roof is fine. I just wanna wait and see what my insurance says. You know, all these like industry specific objections and specifically like how to present the contingency agreement. At that point, I was selling mostly storm work, some retail, mostly storm at that point. And I, it didn't make sense to me. Like, why couldn't I close? I was good with people and a good conversationalist. And then I'm like, oh, I just got to learn how to sell and close properly, <laughs> which is the say. So after I hit that one, I it just lit up like wildfire and in it just blew up for me. And then as soon as I started growing a team, it was the same thing. It was the be, the do, the say, getting the right people, doing the right sales activities each and every day and saying the right thing when they pitch at the door, overcome objections and close deals. And the funniest part is so many, like the, the biggest kind of common thread of issues that I see in this industry is bring people on board and we say, hey, you can earn really good money in roofing sales. Here's some basic training, now go out and do it. No one knows what to do. They're like trained up, like here's the basic of closing a deal and that's it. And when they're out there, there are the people that work hard or put in the hours. And I know many people who are listening have heard me say this, but it's like, if you want a six pack and you go to the gym and do nine hours of bicep curls, no one's going to say that you're lazy or question your work ethic or the time you're putting in. You're just doing the wrong things. And I see reps do this. They do. I call it the one and done. They get out, they go knock doors in this neighborhood. No one's home. This neighborhood, no traction. Go to this neighborhood and they're driving 40 minutes. It's like this grass is always greener in the other side, but it never actually materializes. They don't have a daily plan. They don't know the best way to optimize their time. And they just stay busy for busy. And that to me is is like the number one thing to, to, to fix is to give people that clear path. This is what you do every day. And I've worked with companies as I'm sure Randy, you have too. I'd love your input on this, Randy. I've worked with companies that either struggle to get the right people, duh, right? This one's obvious. Doing the right thing. There are people that are lazy, right? There are great closers who are the ones that are too good for door knocking. I don't do that. Send me leads. But they always have some excuse. If the lead's not great and they don't close, it's never their fault. Someone else's. They're in and out. They're not really willing to keep up with the work. They're not going to open up the neighborhood. So they're the right, they're, they're a good person that's closing deals or saying the right thing, but they're not willing to put in the effort. Likewise, I met with two companies two weeks ago. One company said to me, we did 60 inspections and landed zero sales. I was like, you could cut my tongue out and I could land a sale if, if there were 60 people in front. You know, if you, if I, even if I had a hand sketch, how does that happen? If you, if you did 60 inspections, that's not 60 conversations, 60 inspections. So again, right person doing the right thing can't close the deal to save their life. So each company kind of has, and I shouldn't say each, if a company is struggling to grow, one of these three tiers from a sales standpoint, because again, that's my world. I know Randy, you are, you, you are way smarter than I in the operation side and all of these things. I know you've got your systems in place. I am very focused on the sales and marketing, sales people, sales process. If each three, each one of these kinks is, is failing, growth stagnates. I have seen companies with all three and they're like a, a, a you know, what do they call it? A, dead boat in the water. I know I butchered that saying, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. adrift. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the formula that I teach. And it's kind of the backbone of um, everything that I provide on my, my strategies and my dashboard is to fulfill upon those three to get the right people doing the right thing each day and saying the right thing when they pitch at the door, overcome objections and close. So that's my, again, my philosophy on growth uh, and making sure everyone has all the tools they need in each of those kind of three silos to scale up. But um, I, know, I'm, I know I'm the guest here, but can I spin a question? Randy, I'm curious what your thoughts yeah. are. And if you disagree, throw it at me. I'm all for it. <laughs> no, I think like I play in both worlds with, from there's, I feel like there's two main 
sales approaches. Okay, you have the traditional knock doors, hustle, systemize, mm -hmm. scripts, all the things that go along with that sure. aspect of the business. And the other side is the, you know, almost like you almost approach it like a realtor would, right? When you're going to, when you become a realtor, right? It, it's, you have to create a brand for yourself. You have to create a market. For yourself. You have to, the world needs to know that you sell roofs and, and the more work that you can do to build those relationships and, and to master your craft and to, and to turn every, every job into a referral and, and market yourself in a bunch of different avenues can drive. I've seen both very successful. Agreed. Right. You know, I've seen companies that all they do is door knock become very successful. Our company, I came up from a door knocker perspective and, and I looked at the market and I'm like, everybody's doing this exact same thing. We can continue, no offense to anybody, we can continue to try to tweak and have our angle and our angle and our, great, you can find success. You got, you can find success that way. But the way I think as an entrepreneur is like, how do I just completely remove, my, remove, remove myself and look at the situation from something totally outside the box? Mm -hmm. So what I did, I inserted myself as the homeowner. S storm happens. I, I own a home right here. I'm in my house right now. I own a home. Hail storm happens. I don't know nothing about roofing. Within this day and age, with guys like you teaching everybody how to crush it, like and hail trace and all this damn technology, literally the hail is not even done falling, and I have trucks up and down my driveway, up and down my street, and people knocking on my door. I, I'm I'm gonna get inundated. I, yeah. I don't know what to do, right? Some people I'm waiting for the guy who just gives me the best pitch, who has the best training, who's just gonna say the one thing that stimulates the conversation enough to let me talk to him or let me open that door three more inches yeah. <laughs> to five more inches to finally get open to have that conversation. A million different ways to skin that cat. We all spend a lot of time trying to do that because that's bread and butter. It's tried and true, it's mm -hmm. worked for years and years, right? I looked at it from okay. If, if I were not to go all in with every other company out there, how can I differentiate myself? What is my, what am I going to do as a homeowner? Storm happened. Ton of people just knocked on my door. I probably now know something's up. I got to do something. <laughs> What's my next move? Jump on the internet. Right. I'm going on the internet and, or it's either internet search, or I'm going to call my insurance agent. One of those two things. I chose to go all in on those two things. Yeah. Right. So it's a long game. It's more of a long game. It is. It's okay. I'm not going to be able to just hire and train door knockers and go get instant jobs right here and there. It's a little bit of a long game. Fast forward a couple, you know, year, whatever. It, and then again, you have to decide, are you a storm catcher or a storm chaser? Storm chaser, whether it's even in your local market, you got to be aggressive out on those right away. There's a yep. certain buyer that you're targeting. You know, as a door knocker, like there's certain buyers that you're just not going to close. No, you won't. Not you're just not going to close them. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. So, but there's a market for that. So I'm like, okay, I want to capture that market as best I can and mm -hmm. build my roofing brand in a way that can capture that market. Yeah. And fast forward a number of years, number one rated company on Google, 400 reviews, hundreds of insurance agents that have our whatever swag crap we've done all in on that perspective and we, we do both right so it's like you come up through our training you're going to teach you door knocking teach you that process i'm also going to teach you okay door knocking is prime time from four to six or noon or whatever mm -hmm. what are you doing the rest of the time you better be networking with agents you better be you know emailing doing direct mail doing whatever it can all these other strategies hitting it from both angles so you can capture both audiences versus just yeah. the one audience if that makes sense Again, again, I'm in the same boat. This is my philosophy. It may not work. Some people may argue yeah. with me. Some of you are going to slam me down. You're against door. No, I'm not against door. Okay? Yeah. But I think there's another way. And I've proven that. Yeah. So when a storm happens, while you know, 100 roofers are in this same nest, my team, they're going to there. They're going to go knock doors. But the seeds that we've planted over years of effort, we never even make it to the, we never even make it there before the phones blow up, before we have inspections to go look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the approach. I think, I think both. there's benefit to knowing both. Yeah. I am a advocate of yes to all. 
And the funny thing, first thing on, so I, by the way, um, I also teach to network with insurance agents. I provide checklists for the key stages of a sale. So with my philosophy, because I'll, I'll be frank, I hate knocking doors. I do. There's many people that are like, knock doors, knock doors. But here's the difference philosophy-wise too, because I'll stitch in. You mentioned insurance agents, long game, referrals. Every single thing is in, is, is in a start to finish system that I arm a team with. Yep. And what I find too is a lot of people listening might be working with a company that provides little. So they come to, to folks like me to, to grab those resources. The one thing that I think that's interesting is there's 25 sales opportunities. And again, this is my opinion of things for each customer at the key stages. A new customer signed up. The job gets scheduled. Most people do nothing for this. Day of install, some people work the deals. The job gets done. We do our post, you know, our walkthrough, and then we collect final payment. Those are the five stages. In my program, I give them checklists to follow. First thing on there, get the insurance agent name to introduce yourself. And I provide all the emails. And if they respond, I provide all the emails of what to follow. And the, the big thing too is when we're in the same neighborhood, when we work these key touch points, we dominate the neighborhood. So some people tell me, well, I can't knock doors. It doesn't mean the system doesn't work. You just cut out the cold part. Because when you show up at someone's house for the first time, I say, who the heck are you? But when they've seen you in that neighborhood over and over and over again, the third person that I would, that personally I would throw in the ring, they go online, they ask their agent or they ask a friend. They ask a trusted person in their yeah. network, who should I go to? And when this whole thing goes, same thing, and I'm giving away a lot of secrets here. It says on there, the referral cheat sheet. This is a printout they give the customer with an incentive structure that I've tested through lots of this that I found works really well. Um, and what's funny is the guys that are that are spending money on on leads, you try to run a pay-per-click campaign in Dallas, get your wallet out. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're an and by the way, I'm not saying don't do it, but I believe that people look at lead gen backwards. They look at cost per sale. That's BS. Cost per acquisition is only a piece of the puzzle. I'm looking at cost per neighborhood. If I can buy my way into a neighborhood and then work a system to open up the neighborhood, I'm personally willing to compete at a very high level that someone with a small budget, a medium sized company or small company can compete with the big boys with a targeted approach to get those leads coming in, close them effectively, and then turn that one lead into dominating the neighborhood. And now if you cascade this the right way and work it, you'll get three, four, five, ten. 10. I interviewed a guy 60 years old, he signed 60 homes of 73 in a subdivision. 60 of 73. His name is Bill Sansom. He was just on the channel the other day. He sold 2.2 million in his first year in roofing sales following that system. So anyway, Randy, I'm agreeing with you and adding more that so many people, it's like, it's this, it's this, or it's that. And I'll be okay. frank, everyone's got something to sell, as do I, right? And <laughs> what we need to do is find what those answers are for my particular needs. If you're in a market where you can't knock doors, I have a company out in Florida, gated communities everywhere. They can't get in. So they're using personalized direct mail, you know, leaving letters at the door, getting creative on how they're left, enveloped, you know, writing a little address number on the outside, writing a short little note, fold it up. Curiosity is a powerful motivator. So anyway, I think I think it's neat to 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 explore all the options. And ultimately, what works for one company may not work for the next. And people tell me. People ask me a lot, Randy, I'm curious if you get this too. What do you think of this lead source? And I say, I've worked in multiple states. This lead source did very well here and it sucked over there. So what no. you need to do is find a pot of money that you're willing to part with, willing to lose it all, run an ad campaign, measure how many leads do you get cost per lead? How many leads turn into appointment cost per appointment? How many leads turn into a sale cost per sale? And then if you can, how many did you get in the neighborhood? But at the very minimum, your acquisition costs. Now you know that that lead source can be a cash machine, whether it's cold, whether it's a cold call center, whether it's direct mail, mass direct mail, online marketing, PPC, retargeting, Facebook ads, SEO, you name it. You now have a proven system, but I can't tell you what's going to work in Denver versus what's going to work in Missouri, what's going to work in Little Rock, Arkansas, or what's going to work in Tulsa, because they're all competitive. But at the end of the day, those three elements, if you don't have the right people that are doing the right thing, because the worst thing is a company owner, we hemorrhaged cash on leads before we had a good system to close the leads and follow up on the leads and then turn those into the neighborhood, our, our overhead just, whoop, and I mean, it can get out of control real quick. And yeah. it, it's almost always out of desperation. Owners reach out to me. My team won't knock doors because they're not doing the right thing. So they pour money into the lead funnel. Poor, poor, poor. And then they got complacent guys that are like, 
it's a crap lead, man. How, it was a one legger. I'm like, dude, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> How'd you set that up? <laughs> like, my step, first step is setup in my sales process. Yeah. Got to yep. set the job up properly. If you do yep, a good exactly. setup, you eliminate three out of the five key objections. Yes. Boom, I boom, agree boom. with this. We'll talk a lot more for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's let's shift this as we as, sure. as we start to wrap here. Let, we're gonna have to have a part two, I think. Um, we can do that. Let's ask a marketing guy, right, Nick? This for for the first time yeah. in a long. I, this is the this is the quietest I've ever seen Nick, but he's yeah. the marketing <laughs> guy. He works with contractors all over the country, and I think he can attest, you know, to different markets. Different mm-hmm. things work. It's it's yeah. so crazy to me. Like people want this formula, and as a coach that works the same with you, we work all over the country. It's like people want this. Like here's step one, two, three. Do this, and you're going to blow up. It doesn't work that way. Every yeah. market, every company, every personality, every system, com- culture, they're all different. So you have yeah. to custom tailor your approach mm-hmm. every time. And yeah. I like what Adam said about it. Hey, set aside a certain amount of money that you're willing to part ways with, right? And invest that. And then do not get too attached to a certain type of strategy, right? Just because someone says Google ads is is, is the way to go. Just because someone says Facebook ads is the way to go. Don't yeah. get so committed that this is the strategy that we have to go with, right? Have a budget set aside and then kind of, you know, test different things and find out what works in your market. The... The funniest thing on that front is owners get out of your own way. I would never respond to a mass mailer. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. I would never call an infomercial and I would never call the guy that says, I'm calling about your car warranty. Be like, oh my gosh, really? Let me get my credit card out. But these things work. And there's a difference between what works. I'm by the way, it's been on my video queue list forever and I haven't done it. But the difference between what works and what feels good and what you're, as Randy mentioned, your brand can confidently represent. I couldn't Mm -hmm. send people out using an approach that doesn't resonate with me. Certain door-to-door approaches are very aggressive. And yes, I've heard they work. And some people say they work well. But I can tell you the people that on my team were doing those things, I would get phone calls from very upset customers. And it wasn't worth it to me to pocket some cash to tarnish a reputation and put the reputation of each one of my guys on the line. But that was a side tangent. My point is we need to get out of our own head. If you don't use Facebook, like I don't, I have a blocker. I don't even see a newsfeed. I have the newsfeed eradicator on. I hate Facebook. I'll first tell you. Um, not on there. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I follow because people mention me and I want to be able to engage in the conversation. I'm in this role to serve. So I'm on Facebook for the sole purpose of serving people. I'm not there to go shop around or do whatever. So that's it. Get out of your own head because what works in your market may not be what you would personally choose as an owner. So experiment. And I love what Randy said. Think outside the box. And I think, Randy, what you mentioned about putting yourself in the shoes of the customer Far and away, number one most important skill for anyone in sales to do. Get out of your own way. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel? And you focus on giving that person a real good feeling and good things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Completely so, agree. So, Nick, we could just skip your uh, <laughs> your clothes because- The golden, the golden nuggets. We, already, we laid it all out there. I think, I, think <laughs> it's all, I think it's all out there. All the golden nuggets have been laid. I'm just going to put the cherry on top of that. Mm-hmm. Is- People have a tendency, a natural innate tendency to sell the way that they buy. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you're the guy that's going to go buy a car and you're going to spend three months looking at every little thing online and, and go to the dealership 12 times before you make a decision to buy a car, you're going to sell the same way. And it's going to be acceptable to let a customer control the, control the sale and you're going to sell the same way. If you're the guy that, like me, that's going to, that uh, I remember immediately I mentioned, well, remember I mentioned, <laughs> mentioned earlier I'm obsessive about my time. Yeah. So if, yeah. I, if I can make a decision quick, the decision's done. I'm I'm already past it. I'm so the same way. I need a new TV. I walk in. Where's the best TV? Where's the best value in the best TV? I want that one. I'm walking out. Let's go. Done in 30 minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. However, if I go to every sales approach, trying to sell the way that I buy, I'm going I can't close. <laughs> you talked about the third element. You can't close. Mm-hmm. This right here yeah. is your golden nugget for closing. Yeah. Stop selling the way that you buy. You're blinded by your own personality, the, the way you do things. Mm-hmm. Step outside yourself. Like you just said, step outside yourself. Step outside the box and focus on the people. Ask the questions. Get to know them. They, Your customer will tell you how to sell them, how to close them. Mm-hmm. 
But if you're too ignorant and uh, I'm not putting my down, but if you're if you're unaware enough to where you don't see that, you're going to be blinded and single focused, and you're not going to be good a good salesperson. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The best salespeople are the best listeners. Now, not, Adam, not the best talkers like most many of us think. Many of us we have a tendency. I need a type A, someone that can talk his way in anything and sell ketchup to a woman in a white dress. No, the best salespeople are the best listeners. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam, it's been a pleasure to have you on. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Email me, adam at roofstrategist.com. It's my personal oh. email. No, the Adam at Roof Strategist. And then uh, if you liked any of this stuff, jump on YouTube or the podcast. The Roof Strategist on, can be available on both. And I do new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, yeah, fire away. I'm uh, happy to have some conversations and send over a little curated list of videos I might think that could help you. Mm. And you'll get a good taste for, for my style on the podcast and the YouTube channel. Um, Very try, cool, man. Try, put it to you, see what you think. Very cool, man. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us on episode 159 of the Start yeah. Build Grow Show. Thank you so much God for having bless. me. Appreciate hey, it, Nick. Like, Andy. subscribe to his and all. Like, press the button, subscribe, like Can't it. Get enough podcasts <laughs> in the world. If you're driving around, pull over right now. Yeah. Don't do it while you're driving. Pull over right now. Press the like button. Press the subscribe button. Yes. Press the notification button. We're live on. Share Facebook it. Do it all. Tuesday. Share it out. <laughs> and, uh, and share the love. Appreciate uh, you. Thank you. God bless. Bye, everybody. Yeah.